Buenas tardes. Uh, I'm here uh, uh, replacing Elizabeth Mufu, a great woman, a farmer from Zimbabwe, and also our co-coordinator of La Vía Campesina, an international movement of peasants. And I'm going to start uh, with a brief introduction of La Vía Campesina, because I know that the first thing Elizabeth will do, if she was here, was to do exactly that. So, La Vía Campesina is an international movement uh, of peasants, women, migrants, fisher folks, uh, rural workers, youth. Uh, we are in 70 countries and we represent uh, about 170 member organizations. La Vía Campesina, uh, you know, plays a lot of emphasis on youth and women. The fact is that Elizabeth, a woman, is our general secretary, uh, shows you the importance that La Vía Campesina plays to women. Uh, for example, in our, the form of organization that we have, women uh, plays a very important role. We are organized in a model of parity, where all, we always have a woman and a man in all the decision-making bodies and all the activities of a woman. And we, the men in La Via Campesina, firmly believe that the role of the woman is important in any movement. Actually, we firmly believe that if one day we're going to see a real change, a real transform, social transformation is going to be thanks to the woman. So this is uh, La Via Campesina. We recognize the different uh, the identities of people, and we are the base. And we, you know, even though we are an international movement, most of the decisions come are coming from the member organizations of La Via Campesina. Uh, our main contribution uh, to society is our concept of food sovereignty. In 1996, during the Food Summit of the United Nations, of FAO, they came up with a concept uh, that was called the food security and basically was a concept pushed by corporations. And the idea is that in order to deal with hunger and in order to deal with what they argue those days, you know, the increase in population, that we needed to produce foods at any cost, in any, any form, including transgenic new technologies, uh, heavy use of chemicals. So in a way, what they were saying you know, is that they wanted to deal with food security by increasing the role of corporations, of corporate capital, in our food systems. And we came with an alternative, food sovereignty, which basically means that uh, another, another model of agriculture, production of production and consumption of food, different from corporate world. Corporations don't produce food to take care of the nutritional needs of people. They produce food to make profits. And we say that the most important aspect of food is to satisfy the needs of the communities. And not only that, but to take care of nature, to take care of the, our most, uh, the elements in our societies who are unable to take care by themselves, like children, like the elderly, so that's our proposal. Some people think that food sovereignty is like a political slogan or a trendy cliche, cliche but no, it's an, a, a proposal of a new alternative to our society. Uh, and this, uh, uh, in order to push for food sovereignty, we were also, you know, trying to, to you know, to review the ideas already put out by uh, all the social movements, including the concept of feminism, which uh, the woman in La Via Campesina have been criticizing. And, you know, they have been proposing 
another type of feminism, what we call the peasant fe popular peasant feminism, which don't separate communities, which basically serves to put the woman in a position that is not divided, uh, isolated from the rest of society. So this is, you know, very important slide that I bet you that Elizabeth will, will have spoke a lot. And this is where I'm coming from. This is the, the steel wall being built in the, in the border. This is, I'm standing in Anapra, New Mexico, southern New Mexico, and you can see uh, in the back of the wall, you can see some houses. That place is Mexico, Anapra, Mexico. And the reason because I wanted to start with this uh, slide, this picture, is not, on, not only to, you know, uh, to show you a picture of myself in the border, but to speak about something more important. These days, Mr. Trump is the evil. Everybody speaks about Trump. Every major problem we have is the, the Trump is the responsible. But actually, this wall was started to be built under the Obama administration. And the previous wall was built by the, by the Bush administration. Actually, there's no wall being built by Mr. Trump. And that is very important because sometimes, you know, uh, we tend to forget the atrocities, atrocities in the United States, the atrocities of the Democrats. So I'm going to take this picture to I'm going to take this picture to, to propose something to you. These days seems like society, society don't know what to do with immigration. Nobody knows what to do with immigration. For some sector of society, immigrants are coming to the north to abuse our systems, our economy. Uh, they also may be uh, dangerous to our societies. They may contaminate, you know, the really nice lives that we live in the North. So for some sector, you know, there's a strong anti-immigrant position. For other sector, you know, immigration is something, you know, uh, sad, you know, poor people. They cannot survive in their, in their homelands. Therefore, they have to cross and come to here. So we need to show compassion. We need to establish you know, shelters for immigrants or give them food. You know. so, but that do not solve the problem. The problem. That's not a, a gesture to really deal with the issue of migration. So I'd like to propose that we see migration with a different lens, you know, in a different way. Uh, many years ago, more than 100 years ago, there was a war, another war of occupation of the United States with Mexico. And as a result of that war of occupation, almost half of the Mexican territory became part of what is now United States. So let's just see all those immigrants crossing the border as a national movement of people returning back to their homeland. <laughs> they are coming back to their homeland. But let me propose another way to see migration. Let's see migration from the, using the lens of colonization of the plundering that took place in the south, of the genocide, of the things that we created as a society to create better living conditions for us. You know? So in a way, when they are crossing back, 
They are coming because we have a social debt with them. We created the situation, the condition, the poverty, the exclusion, the violence, everything that makes them go north. So it's very important that we see, because they don't, if we don't see the responsibility that we have, it's going to be very hard for us to really think about how to deal with migration. We need to start thinking about the responsibility we have. Yes, one very quick example. Working people of Canada and United States have been living well in comparison to workers in the South. In the area where I live, Ciudad Juarez, you know, the other side of El Paso, Texas, you have all these maquiladoras, maquiladoras, foreign companies that uh, employ mainly young women, girls. And they, you know, get paid about $5 per day. So just think that the reason because the system was able to give us a little bit more of money, of course, has to do the, with the struggles of unions or working people against capital. But the most important was the transference of wealth from the exploitation in the south to the north. In other words, you know, we were able to live very well thanks to all those million of women in the south who are exploited every day by foreign corporations, including many from the United States. So, I'm going to try to, to make three very important points that need to be uh, embraced by everybody who might, be, who might be thinking on a revolutionary process. Land, labor, and liberation. And because this... Uh, <laughs> and because I know that, you know, that my time will be over soon, I'm going to just go very quick. First, uh, we need to see land as the most important element for any a project of liberation. And everybody of us who were able to read Marx, you know, understand that one of the first instructions was to fight for the control of the means of production. And land is part of the means of production. And not only that, we need to fight for land because that's the only way that we can protect for all this climate destruction going on. The second part is that we need to put immigrants in the, as an act of change, because immigration is also an act of resistance. Actually, migration, when people move from one place to another, is a gesture of resistance against capitalism. When I decide that I don't want to, to, to disappear because this, this system has not uh, given me a place, has excluded me from a place, instead of committing suicide, which is happening in many parts, you know, especially rural parts all over the world, when I decide to leave my family, to leave my land, to leave my belief, my history, everything that represents me, when I cross the border and risk my life, I'm, you know, resistance against capitalism. And I think that that resistance should be very important for any revolutionary process. The other part is, what are the tools for a revolutionary project? One tool is food. Very important tool. You know, we need to fight for food. That's the reason for a proposal of food sovereignty. Uh, if you read the, the Marx and all these, you know, revolutionaries that, you know, to 
that came up with all these ideas, they never say that we want to emancipate labor from capitalism to go into a system and work even more or suffer more. You know? Actually, the idea of emancipation of labor is to be able to live a life, not like today that we work a lot, more than anything, to the point that we don't have time to be with our families. When we go home, we don't have time to play with our animals anymore. Actually, when we go home, many times we continue working. At night, sometimes we are unable to sleep because we're thinking whether that friend sent me the email and whether I need to respond. We are working more than ever. So we need to use food to liberate us from that oppressive type of life. And how, how we can do that? Let's say uh, that we don't want, for example, that we don't want, for example, eat alone. One last point, and that's it. <laughs> let, let, refuse, let refuse to eat. Let refuse to eat from 12 to 1. Why don't we spend more time eating? Why eating alone? Why eating in a hurry? Let's not, let's avoid and let's reject eating junk food. If we have to go early from work in order to prepare food for our, for our spouse and our kids, let's do it. Let's use food for our liberation. Because if you are able, if you are able to have food in your sight, you will not have the pressure that you have to work for somebody all these hours of your day in order to buy food for you. So food is a source of liberation, but has to be a different kind of food, not just any type of food. So in the 70s, there was a concept that came up uh, of chemical free food. Thank you. You're welcome. Sorry that we had to cut that short. Um, the music is great, actually. <laughs> and I have to say that there were many uh, absolutely interesting points that you raised. Um, one being, uh, you say compassion, but I will say generosity as a political act. And, and sort of like also thinking in migration in a different way, I wanted to bring to this conversation that you're trying to raise the notion of coalition, right? The notion that anything that happened to any person in the world happened to any of us, affect any of us. And I think that is fundamental. And, and taking um, the relationship that Via Campesina has established globally, uh, this conversation in the Global South that have been uh, fundamental to define a new feminism. I wanted to ask you if within um, that uh, framework, are you considering as well uh, to implement uh, a different way of addressing migration, right? In, in this sort of like South, Global South conversation that you had through Via Campesina. Yes, the most important is that, uh, that m most of the migrants that we have in the north are the peasants who at one point are unable to continue uh, working to feed their families as a result of uh, uh, neoliberal or anti-peasant policies. So one way to deal with uh, the, to ease the problem of migration is to rebuilding the economies in the south, especially economies that have been destroyed, and especially these days that there's a debate on NAFTA. NAFTA produces four million Mexican peasants with a land. So yes, we, you know, we, we, we think that there, if we, we can work together, we can find the ways to ease migration. Thank you so much. You're welcome.